Hey guys, it's Kickscammer time. Oh yes, the show where I look at the absolute worst Kickstarters, Indiegogos and GoFundMes that have ever found their way onto the internet. Sometimes these campaigns are designed by people that intend to run away with your money. Sometimes the money ends up getting spent on completely different things. And sometimes it's a lot more complicated than just that. This is Patreon or Patreon if you prefer, a game for the Sega Mega Drive or Sega Genesis if you prefer. It was crowdfunded, it had a hefty delay, but it did eventually get released and it's actually pretty damn good. So what's the issue? Well, for anybody in the scene, that being the retro gaming scene, specifically the Sega 16-bit retro gaming scene, will understand that Paprium, as perfectly fine as the game is, actually ended up bringing with it an insane amount of baggage. This title at one point was pure vaporware. It was believed to be a scam, overpromised and heavily delayed. It had terrible customer service attached to it and really does have so much negativity surrounding its release. So much so that quite a few people who spent well over a hundred pounds on this title, yeah, it wasn't a cheap title to buy, actually refuse to even play it. Why was that? Well, with so many videos and articles being written about this game's terrible development, I decided to reach out to the one person that can tell the story properly. Hey guys, my name is Stika and I run the channel Stika. And on top of all my usual Sega Mega Drive content, I have taken a keen interest in the development of Paprium. Not only reviewing the game, but also interviewing the developers and covering the issues along the way. Between Stika and I, we plan to tell you all the complete history of this game and how it came to be. Was it a scam? Was it mismanaged? Was it a money laundering exercise as it once was believed to be? Well, let us tell you the whole story and then you can be the judge of that in this. The Paprium Scandal. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Hey there guys, I hope you are enjoying the video. Before continuing ahead, a few things. Go and support Steaker. No, seriously, go on, go and do it now. A great channel. No, without him, this video just would not have been possible. Thanks to King Monkey as well for lending me the game we're talking about today. And thanks to Rewind Mike who helped on the editing side of things. Links to all of those channels can be found in the description, along with a link to my Twitch channel where I'll be streaming Paprium this Thursday, as the Mega SG has now been updated and now allows us to play this very game. When I release this video early for Patreons and YouTube members on the 23rd of April 2021, that system was unable to play it. Join in to check it out live. And finally, if you want to see any of the next four episodes before they go public, you can indeed do so by becoming a Patreon and YouTube member. Thanks for your support, but for now, let's get on with the video. The year was 2004. GTA San Andreas had just been released for the PlayStation 2, Spider-Man 2 was out in the cinemas, and the Mega Drive or Sega Genesis for all you Americans out there was long dead. Sure, Tectoy may have released a port of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire three years prior under the title Show Do Mil Heo, but by that point even Brazil had its eyes set on the PlayStation 2 and not so much on Sega's classic hardware. That is with the exception of a now defunct Sega website called Edolons Inn. This was the place where Sega fans would go to get the latest info on new emulator releases and just genuinely have a good time with like-minded Sega fans. It was here that Tulio Goncalves and Gwinnell Goad, also known as Fonzi, set out to create a new game for the aging system. Inspired by the likes of Squaresoft's Chrono Trigger and the Final Fantasy series, they decided to create a JRPG of their own under the title Tavern RPG. This was meant to be a simple project for the Mega CD, with the various community members appearing in the game as either main characters or side characters. 
Eventually, other community members from Eidolon Zen and Sega 16 liked the idea so much that they would join the project, turning it into a massive fan-made endeavor with a six-year development cycle. On top of this, the game also grew from its simple roots to a full-fledged fantasy RPG for the Mega Drive. The development process was tough, as none of the development staff were industry professionals, and most were learning as they went whilst developing it. But eventually, in 2010, Tavern RPG was completed and released in physical format under the name Pierce Solar, making it the first RPG for the system in nearly 15 years. But this wasn't just any old RPG though. This particular game boasted a 64 megabit cartridge, which completely trumped anything else on the system, including the previous champion, which was Super Street Fighter 2 by 24 megabits. The game also featured an impressive connectivity with the Mega CD in which it would run the game off the cartridge but would unlock additional features such as an improved soundtrack if you bought the accompanying CD as an extra. It even had the occasional Mode 7 like graphics to show off just how capable the console was under the right hands. And indeed, the game was well received by gamers and critics alike, many of which were delighted with the idea of the Mega Drive receiving a brand new game in an era where everyone was off playing on their PlayStation 3s, 360s and Wii's. Its commercial success also surpassed everybody's expectations, with several reprints being issued over the years, and the studio's co-founder, Grinnell Goad, stating that it's unlikely that any other modern Mega Drive game has sold as much as Pierce Solar did. However, despite the success, things weren't so rosy with the studio. Many of its volunteers became frustrated with the project's slow progress, or that their opinions were not being taken into consideration, while others felt that they weren't properly compensated, as they originally signed up for what was meant to be a free game. And even though Pure Solar became a paid product, most of these workers only received physical copies as their payment. Worst of all, towards the final year of development, the friendship between Tulio and Gwenael began to deteriorate. Besides these minor issues, Pier Solar proved two major things to Tulio and Gwenael, and that was that there was a hardcore group of Sega fans willing to buy new games for their aging systems, and that these guys had what it took to make those games. And because of this, the video game studio Watermelon was born. Watermelon was a studio solely focused on developing games for retro systems. In early 2012, they also launched their own website, The Magical Game Factory, where you could order your PSLR reprints and read all about their upcoming projects. And boy, there would be a lot of projects! In its first year alone, Watermelon announced a total of three different projects for three different systems. The first two were simply known as Project 10 and Project Y for the Super Nintendo and Mega Drive respectively. But rather than announcing what these new games were, Watermelon decided to take a slightly different approach. The idea was that they would have their community vote on gameplay and thematic elements for a gems system. This meant that fans could buy gems from the Magical Game Factory website and vote for whatever style of game that they were more interested in. And the more gems you owned, the more your vote would count. And not only that, but they could also pre-order the game using these gems too, meaning the earlier pre-orders for this game actually date back to 2012. For Project Y, the results of the polls showed that an RPG beat-em-up with a cyberpunk and post-apocalyptic aesthetic was what half the crowd wanted. And for Project N, fans wanted an action-slash-action-adventure title with a light and dark contrast aesthetic. Project Y would of course become Patreon, but Project N... Well, we haven't actually got anything to show you for Project N because there's practically no footage to go by. And finally, on top of all of this, in November of 2012, Tulio and Fonzie announced their third project, an HD port of Pier Solar for the Sega Dreamcast, Steam and other modern consoles, or at least modern consoles for the time. And yes, that does mean a port was originally planned for the Ouya. <laughs> Remember this thing? But 
between the gem system, pure solar reprint orders and the Kickstarter, Watermelon had achieved a steady cash flow, and even started to operate in physical offices in 2013 to develop their games. Yes, you heard me, a studio making games for the Mega Drive, Dreamcast and Super Nintendo in 2013 was successful enough to own actual offices. Not only that, but due to the success of Pure Solar and the hype for Watermelon's upcoming projects, the mainstream gaming media was keeping a close eye on the company, constantly writing articles either promoting Pure Solar or their upcoming projects. Suddenly, this small studio now had articles on Eurogamer, IGN, Game Informer, Polygon, Silicon Air, Nintendo Life, you name it, chances are they promoted it. But Watermelon had way more up their sleeve. They were going to be releasing Paprium with a partnership with At Games onto their systems, and on top of that, they were also getting into publishing too. Out of nowhere, it seems, Watermelon was now contacting indie developers who had small projects on the Mega Drive with the purpose of signing a publishing deal with them too. This culminated in Watermelon launching Pappy Commando and Sacred Line Genesis for the Mega Drive and, well, we are still not done yet. At some point, Tulio and Fonzie had also taken a trip to Japan to secure the Mega Drive rights to Langrisser 2 and Vixen 357. These were two tactical RPGs released exclusively in Japan for the Mega Drive in the 90s, and now, almost 20 years later, they were planning to launch them physically in the West. So for all of you guys out there keeping score at home, this means that at one point, Watermelon had at least seven projects in the works. Project Y, Project N, Pierce Solar HD, Pappy Commando, Sacred Line Genesis, Languisa 2, and Vixen 357. And to make things even worse, when I interviewed Gwenelle on my channel, it was implied that there were even more publishing projects being discussed before their cancellation. That's a lot of games for such a small studio. And as you might imagine, working on so many projects at the same time, when it took them 6 years to release their first game, might not have been the best of ideas. Heck, at one point they even planned to sell Nintendo and Sega themed soaps. And whilst we did get Puppy Commando and Sacred Line Genesis published, every other project seemed to have gone silent. In no small part because the frictioning relationship between Fonzie and Tulio had completely broken down by this point. According to Tulio, it all culminated with Fonzie throwing wild accusations at him before moving back to France and taking the entirety of Project Y, or Papillon if you prefer, with him. So suddenly, Tulio had no access to anything Paprium related except for the sound related tools which he himself developed. This wasn't helped by the fact that Fonzie had spent the entirety of Paprium's budget by this point, and that Tulio refused to dip into these funds of other projects in fear that it could jeopardize them as well. It was at this point that Watermelon as a studio began to crack. Tulio would stay on at Watermelon to finish the development of Pier Solar HD, releasing it for every system that was promised, as well as sending some of the physical rewards out too. But once that project was done on July 2015, Tulio finally left Watermelon and by this point, both Paprium and Watermelon missed their 2014 launch date. It was from this point forward that Watermelon began to slowly lose the goodwill that it had gained up to this point. We don't know for sure what went on between Tulio and Fonzie, but we do know that Tulio was genuinely the one in charge of the business side of things and was also the one that kept its fan base informed on the status of each project. Now to be fair to Watermelon, during this time they did have someone else looking after their social media posts, which basically meant that these social media posts didn't really have any progress on what was actually going on at Watermelon. But instead, these posts just proved to try and stop all of those people that pre-ordered from kicking off and just trying to get them to stop losing their patience. However, by early 2017, things were not going well. Both Paprium and Project N were already three years past their promised launch date. Paprium would receive several new launch dates, all of which would be missed. But at the very least, some new information would occasionally surface. Project 10, on the other hand, had no new developments or information since 2014. And from this point, Nintendo fans had mostly chalked it up to a loss. Additionally, some Pure Solar HD Kickstarter rewards hadn't been sent out yet, including a Pure Solar branded Sega Dreamcast. 
And as if that wasn't enough, Sasha Darko, the developer behind Sacred Line Genesis, would spread the word to other developers that Watermelon still owed the money. It's also not entirely clear when, but it was around this time that the Watermelon Studios were closed, and Fonzie had moved to China. All in all, not a good look. Eventually, it became clear that Watermelon had dwindled down to nothing but Fonzie, which basically meant that Paprium was going along at a complete snail's pace, and all of those other projects were either cancelled or just completely pushed aside. And then, out of nowhere, in May of 2017, a new trailer was released to the public, and for the first time, everybody got a glimpse of what the game actually looked like, and, to put it bluntly, it looked amazing. incredible was that and look an actual release date too as well as a pre-order page now people might have felt burnt over all of the drama that had built up over the last few years but finally there was actual progress being shown here the graphics look comparable to a neo geo game which was impressive in of itself and on top of that the game was going to be released on an 80 megabyte cartridge even surpassing pierce solar's already impressive 64 megabit cartridge and it would even include a co pro processor for the music known only as a Daytonmeister. In other words guys, if you as a fan of Sega's most iconic console and one of the most iconic consoles of all time, then you were going to be able to get yourself a cartridge that was the biggest and baddest cartridge that that system had ever seen and now there was actually proof of it, how could you not be excited? Ask any retro gaming fan who watched that trailer when it first came out and most would agree that Paprium looked like the real deal. So clearly, from here on out, it had been nothing but smooth sailing, right? Right? Wrong. Watermelon's track record is nothing if not bumpy. It seems all those pre-orders raised some eyebrows over at PayPal and they thought something was up. So they seized the funds and locked them for fear that it might be a money laundering scheme. Unfortunately though, we don't know for sure what went between Watermelon and PayPal. All we do know is that at the time of this video, the funds have yet to be released and Fonzie <laughs> accused PayPal China of being run by the Mafia and that all of the money was funneled into drugs, guns and prostitution. I don't get it either. And of course, it didn't help that Watermelon only announced that this had happened in the same month that Paprium was set to release, which meant of course yet another missed deadline. It was at this point that the fans had completely lost it. Go to any dedicated forum or social media post regarding Paprium at this time and you will basically find nothing but people saying that this is a scam. People were asking for refunds or getting chargebacks and for a time they were successful in doing so, but eventually even those refund requests were basically getting ignored. Then 2018 went by and no new information was given whatsoever. The company had gone completely silent, save for a post or two stating that they were still negotiating with PayPal. But other than that, it was complete silence, leaving everyone impatient as this time there wasn't even a new launch date planned. And then, suddenly, on October 2018, a Paprium launch party was announced, taking place in a nightclub in Paris 
everyone would finally see the game running on real hardware. And the announcement even promised that a follow-up email would be sent after the party with details on how people could get their game. At this point, the community had been burned several times by Watermelon and Paprium, but most were once again hopeful to finally see the game, while others who had written Paprium off were curious to see if this would be another fiasco. Spoiler alert, it was a fiasco. The party itself was a lavish affair with DJs, dancers, bands, catering, arcade cabinets and soda cans decked in paprium vanille for a company that claimed to have had its funds seized. It sure did seem like a lot of money was being thrown into this event, but that could all be forgiven if the game was ready. But sadly, it wasn't. The game itself came in on a loose PCB which didn't inspire a lot of confidence, the game was buggy, it crashed and worst of all, it had no enemies. All you could do was walk forward and attack the air, either alone or with a friend. And if you were hoping to hear that extra audio chip at work, well, then you would also be disappointed because there was absolutely no sound in this game at all. It seemed as though the only redeemable thing about all of this was the fact that despite there being no enemies, the graphics looked amazing and definitely seemed to have lived up to the hype of the Neo Geo-like graphics. The day after the party ended, it seemed as though the dream was finally over. Paprium and Watermelon had become a joke. The community was furious and though the official Watermelon Facebook account replied to a few comments, this too would soon stop. Once again, Watermelon went into complete silence with no further communication for the rest of the year and only making one Facebook post in 2019 stating that the cartridges and arcade sticks were being manufactured and placed into storage. But at this point, it was too little, too late. No one believed Watermelon anymore and no one was taking their side. The studio had lost all of its credibility. People were complaining that their refunds weren't going through and you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that had faith in Paprium. And from here on out, there was no more communication throughout 2019 and practically nothing in 2020. And then out of the blue in December of 2020, the game was out. Yes, surprising absolutely everyone, an email was sent out stating that Paprium was being shipped at that very moment. Many people were still so burned by Paprium and Watermelon that they didn't believe this, myself included. But lo and behold, people started receiving their games and Paprium was simply amazing. Paprium was by far one of the best beat em ups to have ever graced the Mega Drive. With amazing graphics, a wide variety of moves, several playable characters, a multitude of secrets, alternate endings and alternate paths. It was everything we were promised and more. And yes, the cartridge comes with an extra chip that provides extra audio channels and helps with graphics decompressing. In a recent interview, Fonzie would state that he went into hiding because he felt that nothing he could do or say would turn the opinions in his favor. And so, he ended up doing it to protect his mental health. But after receiving the game, many fans turned around, feeling that Watermelon had finally lived up to its promise. And you're probably thinking that this is where the story ends, but it wouldn't be a Watermelon story if that was the case now, would it? For one thing, the extra processor came with a metal plate for protection, which had a habit of popping out and would have to be manually removed to avoid short-circuiting the console. The game also came with a manifest in which Fonzie lays all his thoughts. And honestly, it needs to be read to be believed. Here are just a few examples. You are a few minutes away to enjoy the best of the 90s experience. Please take a few moments to read this page. No matter how long the wait, the game is here. I, Fonzie, could be sorry for the wait and the lack of news, but I already gave them away long ago. This is a one-in-a-lifetime experience, an exclusive AAA game in 90s flavor, 100% custom and released for the 30th anniversary of the system. 
Make sure you use an original Mega Drive or Sega Genesis system. This game pushes the hardware and will underperform on clones and other freshly molded turds. The game is best played with six button controllers. Put on your pajamas and a pair of sports socks. Alternatively, wear the official Paprium underwear along with a bathrobe. Tune up the heater. First, plug your favourite Streets of Rage or Golden Axe cartridge and give it a 5 minutes play. Not only will this get your memories reset, but it will ensure your setup is working and warm up the VDP. Don't open the game, leave it sealed, put it on eBay, make 500-1000% to 1, profit. Moreover, you can ween everywhere about the game being bad. Just look at others unboxing and gameplay videos for some scumbag grade legitimacy. As for Pier Solar's release, there are great amounts of controversies, trolling, jealousy. I Fonzi says, fuck them. This is just some small rant for those who are interested or not aware of Watermelon's background. Hint, games don't grow on Chinese trees. Conclusion, would I do it again? Maybe yes, to pursue the Sega 16-bit legacy. Only new 16-bit games matters. Anything else is gadgets or commentaries. Again, a big thanks to everybody involved, customers and supporters. Don't listen to the mediocres, this is a rare achievement and a huge success. The game is there, that's all matters. Enjoy your play. Nota, on the good side, I got proof that pressure doesn't cause cancer, but I should also test for AIDS because this hurts. P.S. Sega, if you're reading, man up, call me, Bissau. Gwinnell Fonzie Go, 16th of the 16th, 2020. And finally, the game wasn't compatible with some Model 1 Mega Drives, clones, or modern solutions like the Mega SG. But despite that, most would agree that Paprium is one of the best beat'em ups ever released for the system. Well, that's Steaker's opinion. For me, insert review here. Thanks, Retro Slope. Future Slope here, and yes, I've finally played it through a couple of times now and I'm actually quite blown away by this title and the amount of stuff that it can do on my favourite retro gaming system. I've never seen this amount of high quality sprites in one game and in a game of this genre. The music feels weirdly nostalgic quite early on, which is kind of weird considering it's a new game, but for me that means that it's actually pulled on just the right amount of nostalgic heartstrings that us brawler fans have been holding on to for all of these years. Throughout the game I was constantly smiling at the impressive background elements and the chasing saxophone guy. The game is a complete marvel to look at, and if it was teased back in the day during the system's prime then it would indeed look like the future of gaming. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the pastel purple pinky colorization of the game. To me, it really should be a super neon filled type of game and it actually feels a little dark and muted for the most part. But honestly, this is just my personal preference. The graphics itself for this system are of course stunning. But with all that said, Paprium isn't really for me, at this stage at least. Look, I'm a massive Sega Mega Drive fan and yes of course I'm happy that this exists for the Mega Drive fans out there, but honestly, the fact that it only just about works on the system, it possibly was even purposefully released to not work on the Mega SG and comes quite often with parts of it just falling off inside the cartridge, I actually would have been much happier from a gameplay point of view at least if this was released for, I don't know, the PlayStation or the Neo Geo or something. Of course I do not understand ins and outs of what actually went into the technical side of things here. Some insanely talented people worked on this title, but it was pushed so far off the charts that it's actually unplayable on some of the systems it was actually designed for. If you can get it working, it's an absolute spectacle from a technical standpoint. It broke down so many barriers that the Mega Drive put up, but at the end of the day, it still has some of those barriers that it's never going to be able to take down and therefore to me it feels like a Mega Drive port of a Saturn PlayStation or a Neo Geo type of game. 
technically it's outstanding, but not as good as it could have been if those barriers were not there in the first place. Everything about this is style over substance. For me, I did indeed have fun with the game. In fact, I would even go as far as to say it's actually better than quite a few of the system's more well-loved side-scrolling beat-em-ups. And as a collector for the system, I would love to have this on the shelf. But honestly, that is where it would stay. What I really, really want is for Fonzie to actually earn himself some more money by releasing it on more powerful machines, the same way Bitmap Bureau have done with the Xeno Crisis game. The upgrades on that particular game are pretty much just cosmetic, but here they could do wonders to the few issues that I found whilst playing the game. If you are watching this watermelon, release a big old collector set for a more powerful console. What you have done here is technically fantastic, but now it's time to push that aside and let fans experience what is almost an excellent game, only taking into account its actual gameplay rather than being impressed that it can run on a system that it doesn't feel like it should have ever been on in the first place. Anyway, that's our opinion on the game. More importantly though for this particular story is the fact that Fonzie actually started to do interviews again once this game was out and he explained that the reason he was so quiet during 2019 and 2020 was because he'd realised that he had just lost all of his credibility. The best thing to do was just to shut up and get the game out. With that said though, there is still a lot of information that is currently in the air. Like for example, did every former member of staff at Watermelon actually get paid? Fonzie did state publicly that he was unaware of any money being owed to anyone, but it's still something that is as yet unconfirmed. So what now? Well, with Paprium behind them, Watermelon finally had the ability to move on. They've already announced a new game, a beat-em-up for the Mega Drive known as AM96 by this point, and have even resumed development of Project N with the original programmer. Additionally, people could actually go and order Paprium and Pier Solar on their website, so things were looking up for Watermelon, right? Right? Not exactly, because PayPal has withheld their funds once again, and there are still a few people who haven't received their Paprium copies or gotten their refunds yet, so it seems that everything is starting all over again. We do at least know that this time the issue was with the American branch of PayPal instead of the Chinese one, and Fonzie himself stated that he's confident he can actually liberate his funds this time. But for all we know, this may take a while. And there you have it. The complete history of Watermelon, Pierce Solar and Paprium up to this point. All things considered, it seems that Fonzie was not the scammer everyone was painting him to be. It's clear he's passionate about his project and wanted to deliver the best that he possibly could. But with that said though, it also seems like he has difficulties running the business side of the company and that his entrepreneurial skills could be better. So, will AM6 and Project N ever be delivered? I'd like to think so. Things seem that sooner or later the games will be released. The question is, just how long will it take? And in conclusion, Paprium is an incredibly interesting beast. As stated, the game is actually pretty impressive. But for me, the real interesting part of this cartridge is its history. The crazy breakup between the giants, how it began, its insane development, which is still somewhat shrouded in mystery, and of course, Fonzie himself. One of the more interesting people, for better or worse, working in the retro gaming scene, a chap that has no qualms in ruffling the feathers of his already niche market that he's going after, and a guy that makes so many crazy decisions that in all honesty, he's bordering on lunacy. And personally, I wouldn't have it any other way. This is without a doubt one of the most interesting and bizarre cartridges ever to be released on this system, and for that, I congratulate him. We have covered plenty of projects that are not scams per se in the Kick Scammer series, and of course, feel free to come to your own conclusions down below. But for me, this guy isn't a scammer. He's an eccentric entrepreneur that does things his own way, again, for better and definitely for worse. Hey there guys, thank you all for checking out the video. Now this is the 
part of the video where I normally give a massive shout out to all of my Patreons and YouTube members and I'm going to, as always, but first, as stated, please do, uh, please do go and check out Stika, an incredibly underrated channel for all of you people out there that are into heavy, uh, uh, lots of retro gaming uh, factoid type videos, then, you know, he's definitely a channel worth checking out. Thank you so much for helping me create this video, Stika, and guys, go and support him because he's very, very good, very underrated. Shout him out before and I'm hoping you guys go and check him out. Tell him Slope sent you. Also, thank you to Rewind Mike for helping on the editing side and thank you for King Monkey who gave me this. Well, didn't give me. <laughs> oh, no way. For lending me this, Paprium. It's, um, yeah, it's it's like I said, it's it's a good game. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite crazy. And like I said, since I've created this particular video, it now works woo, on this, on the Mega SG. So make sure you come along to twitch.tv forward slash Slopes Game Room this Thursday to come and check it out live i'll try and get it up on the second channel perhaps we'll see um uh, i'm in two minds about that in all honesty but yeah come and check it out over on twitch.tv forward slash slopes game room where i will be playing it on the hardware so thank you thank you thank you um also thank you to all of the youtube members and patreons that allow me to create these videos every single week i've got plenty more coming and um yeah uh, like i said i always like to try and make sure that those guys are about six videos ahead roughly there's three available right now and i'm working on another two which gets it up to five so i'm getting a lot closer i'm getting a lot closer so that's six ahead for you patrons and youtube members um yeah and uh, you can go and check them out right now by becoming a patreon or youtube member just like these awesome people Aaron Gorman, Agro Craig, Andrew Dalton, Arista, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, Bran Perez, Brandon Gold, Cheshire One, Chris the Shapeshifter, Christopher Devero, uh, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, Action Saction, Dalton, aka Chevmatic, Daniel Terrares, Darren Watson, Dina, Dina81, Diggs B, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Intrigued Gaming, Jay is Manchild, Jabba Al Aiden, Jacob P, aka Avalon James, James, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Rodriguez, Joff Gib Josh Gibbon, <laughs> uh, King Link Reviews, Lucas Gates, Lucas Softel, Man of God 9000, Man Shovel, Matt Jackson, Michael Ridley Dash, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Nightwill, Over Jazz, Over Jal Zane, um, Pretendo 64, Roll VP, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldergic, Rocket Plod, Roven Army, Ryan Holt, Samuel Nielsen, Shade Silent, Shadow, Shadow Dragon, um, Solid's Captor, Stephen Tatty, The Art. Artists. Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, Tim Labonte, Tim Lund, Todd Paul Float G, Trans Rights, Vike Echo, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. Like I said, guys, thank you all so, so much for your support. Come and support the show just like these awesome guys and see plenty of videos before they go live. You get to see loads of stuff that I'm working on before I um, uh, get it out. You get to see early versions of them, uh, unedited version of them, um, versions of them without adverts, all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, and, uh, it's these guys that uh, allow me to create the videos that I still like to create. And thankfully, uh, I like to think you guys do too. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's probably it now, isn't it? Yeah, I think we're there. I think we're there. Until next time, guys. This is DJ Slope signing out. And hopefully, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.